All right. Hello, everyone. Brian Lickasar. I go by Licko. I'm a global director of solution architecture here at Stormforge. And what I want to do is kind of take a deep dive into Optimize Live and our recent announcement around the HPA-based recommendations and what that will do for our customers. So the challenge that customers face is that they have two options when it comes to auto scaling in Kubernetes. They've got the VPA or vertical pod auto scaler and the HPA, horizontal pod auto scaler. Uh, VPA is arguably a little older than the HPA as far as when it went upstream. And it's based on resource utilization. So just as the name implies and what you might think that means, it's kind of like the right sizing. The challenge that you have with that, and I'll show you this in an upcoming slide, is that you have to know your app kind of right away. You have to know this is what it's going to use. And frankly, a lot of app teams don't pay attention to that. They don't know, or they want to deploy it first and then kind of go back. And the going back is uh, probably the lowest priority on the tech debt pile. HPA, which has been used forever and very, very popular, adds and removes pods horizontally, of course, based on the inbound. A lot of times though, what they're doing is they're doing a, a template approach because you have to configure this up front. And I'll show you that in a moment based on CPU utilization is kind of the de facto standard here. Well, with that, the default is 60%. Is 60% right? I don't have the answer. It depends on your app. Some apps are more CPU bound, some more IO bound, et cetera. Maybe that's not best for you. But when you use them both together, they work against one another. Because what you can end up having happen, regardless of how the app behaves, by the way, is based on solely on CPU and memory metrics, you could have a really, really, really big pod and only scale out to one, or you could have a really, 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 really small one scaled out to thousands, and neither way did you solve your problem that you're trying to solve by being efficient. Uh, also, uh, partners at Datadog have a really great kind of state of the cloud um, report they put out every year. 40% of organizations use HPAs and less than one use VPAs. Uh, I was looking at the VPA the other day because uh, I hadn't in a while, and it doesn't seem to be as well maintained either. It's almost like people are kind of, I don't want to say giving up on it, but it just doesn't have that. And I think you all know with open source, if it's not actively being maintained, it's not being maintained. Like it doesn't matter. And we have, we still have this challenge if I can soapbox for one second where too many people are consumers of open source and not enough are giving back. So um, that could end up being an abandoned situation, which I'd hate to see. So real quickly, if I can show you the YAML manifest, which I know that's why you got up this morning is to see a YAML manifest. Uh, if I can show you the YAML manifest of a, a typical VPA, I've highlighted in yellow here, the specific things for a given application, like the name of the application, what's the minimum CPU you'll tolerate, what's the maximum memory. And this is for Nginx, which is not a resource intensive app whatsoever, but you need to know this for everything. So again, what I typically see is you have some sort of center of excellence team, or you have some SME group who is providing these templates to their users and saying, use this, not really providing them guidance, not really helping them find out how to fill these in. And again, why should they? What's the application group's incentive to do it? I'd like to think they're good corporate citizens, but that's not reality. And then if we go to the HPA, which is talking about scaling out, how do they know that the number of replicas they need is as low as one, as high as 10? And then more importantly, or the argument I make all the time is how do you know at what point CPU wise you need to ramp that up and have another copy to take the work. And so here's the kind of virtuous thrashing cycle, <laughs> virtuous. It just kind of goes in a cycle. And basically this is gonna either go all the way down to nothing or all the way up to infinity. I've only seen it do the down to nothing so far myself, but. Um, it's really easy to make this happen. And again, I want you thinking on this previous slide, I, I showed a copy of this. I was going to do a cute animation, but that's not my style of this just replicating indefinitely because that's a real environment. That's what ends up happening in customer environments. When you say scale down to nothing, could you quantify that in terms of, I guess you're talking about that in terms of uh, VPA, not HPA? Well, so when they're working, when they're working, what happens is like here, okay, the minimum allowed was 40 on the VPA one. And then the replica count is one based on this. So what will end up happening is the HPA will see that the utilization is under 50% or something like that. And it will go down to one replica because it sees no load. Meanwhile, the VPA is like, gosh, the utilization is getting higher. I should add more to it. And then the HPA will do it again. When they spiral down to almost nothing, it tends to be a, a miss in cycles. These two don't talk to one another. 
they work on their own intervals. Uh, HP default, I want to say, is every 15 seconds. VPA, I believe, is configurable with a default of one minute. I know we're kind of getting into the minutia of the time slices here, but you could have like a 45 second window there where they are not anywhere near seeing what each other's seeing. And that's where it typically happens. But again, a lot of my experience on that is in like a controlled lab environment, not real world. So I don't know if this happens in the real world. I haven't heard anyone do that or tweet about it or anything I've seen, but. We're getting into the minutia, but that is really where, where this value lies, right? Because if you're seeing pulling intervals that are longer than the needs of uh, application, that's where this really comes in and really shows its worth. Yeah. Um, so I think it's valid for everyone to hear about those things. Yeah, of course. Um, but you you said the words I triggered yeah, uh, when I heard scale to scale to zero. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, I think of K native and all the ability to scale yeah. to absolute zero. Yeah, zero. Okay. That is not this. No, 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 no. Okay. That's more. And in, in fact, to me, that was more of a, a challenge or a problem statement in the sense that they didn't intend for these to work against each other so poorly that the app is basically unavailable to the users. Think of it that way, as opposed to the, hey, it's uh, Saturday and no one's working in this environment. Let's save all that resource. It's nothing like that. This is more of the problem. Like we've got autoscalers in prod and it all scaled to zero. Oops. That would be cool though. <laughs> if, <laughs> I get you. if you I could respond you. in real time, I, I think there is a, a lot of customers that would, zero, that would, well, if there is no load, no one's actually using the application. I. I would not be, I'd be pretty okay with it being- It's almost like port zero. knocking, right? Like wait till that request comes in to spin it back up. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And that's that's where things like, you know, Knative and other solutions like that live because yeah. people do like the idea of having nothing running until someone actually needs it and then it spins it up. It's that idea of like self-service without a long ramp up time. Sure. Um, the, I think the other side of that coin tends to be what's the warm up time, right? Like how fast can you get? Absolutely. Because I don't know, my experience, they always come by the bus load. You don't get one person off that bus, you get the bus. So I was like, are you ready? Uh, I think yep. I just threw myself under the bus. Same. Well, even the other challenge, just the fact that you're measuring on those, yeah, you said they're, they're disparate intervals. Mm -hmm. And so there's convergence of when those things are actually going to bump into each other, which is kind of cool if you graphed it out. But they're also measuring just raw averages across the one minute cycle versus we don't set SLOs on raw average. You set SLOs you want 95th percentile at seven millisecond latency. Yes. Or 99th percentile, like you want to super tightly tune. Yeah, average just like, eh. Close enough. Right. Well, and it's in most, if not all the SLOs and SLAs I'm aware of are about customer experience over anything else. So can you draw correlations between CPU utilization and the customer happiness? I don't, some people try to, I think it's much more about that as well. I mean, fair point. But. One would posit that you're using Kubernetes. There are no happy customers. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Um, I, I included this, I, you know, again, I, I recognize my audience and I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, but I found it interesting. Uh, Airbnb put uh, on their blog last, last year, I think it was, um, some things that they were running into because they basically saw a point where their costs kept going up as more people rented Airbnbs and they were trying to kind of keep that ratio down. And so they did a nice write up on this. But two of the interesting things I found was that the, on the left-hand side, they talk about surfacing this. And again, this is the kind of good corporate citizen thing. Frankly, people don't care. Like it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission, it, all these things. So even Airbnb was challenged by this and they are a cloud native company. In other words, they never had a data center of their own. So, you know, a lot of the folks I talk to still have data centers today that they manage or colos. Um, I found that pretty interesting. And then what they found was that their services were using the HPA what they're alluding to, I believe, I didn't ask them, I certainly could, uh, was the template problem, right? They stamped it out. Everyone used the same thing. That's not right for everyone. And no one ever visited it. No one ever investigated it. They frankly ignored it. I think you made a really interesting point at the very kind of beginning of the series with the, the showing us the YAML. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the complexity of running the application has gotten shifted left. The developers never knew how many resources they really needed. They just want to write the thing that solves the problem. They don't care about all the trappings that go around it. Right. I feel like you've hit a, a sweet spot here that you now are enabling those who are the operational folks to actually have a half a chance of actually getting it right for them on their behalf, and they don't have to worry about it at all. So I, I applaud you for that being kind of the developer in the room. I'm maybe one of the weirder ones who actually does understand resource you know, utilization and, and how to tune, but most have no clue and no desire right. whatsoever to be in that area. Right. No, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, that's why I get, that's why I'm excited about what we're doing. Yeah, no, I, get, I totally get it. I'm, I'm excited. I want to see the demo now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, let me, let me try and get to that quicker. Um, so I, we talked about this slide in a previous presentation. Let me uh, recap it very quickly. 
Optimize Live is running. It's watching the observability from uh, systems like Prometheus and Datadog, seeing the requests that were made, but also the actual usage, looking at that delta, looking at patterns of that over time, and then directly applying that via deployment patch to the Kube API in real time right away. Uh, when I say in real time, I should correct that. Once an hour is the most aggressive we get. Reason we do that is some deployments don't instantly start up. Startup times can be a thing, especially if you're orchestrating across a deployment that has dependency chains. Uh, so we want to be thoughtful about that. Plus, we don't want the machine learning watching that and saying, you know, oh gosh, it, it, it wasn't even running because it was in the middle of a restart. Well, no kidding. Um, so that's another element of it. Are, the, are those like TTL on each particular uh, container or is it the, like basically you batch push all changes in, in at, at one time per hour? We do them all one time per hour. Again, that's like the default out-of-box experience. Um, across everything in a given namespace. So that's the boundary is a namespace. Uh, and that's because namespaces tend to be, we haven't seen, I think this is true. I, I don't believe we've seen a situation where changing everything in a namespace at once doesn't already have that sorted out as far as pod readiness times and things like that that they've already worked out, as well as um, everyone has their own uh, deployment models, right? Some do the canary, some do blue green, they've got the different approaches, rolling restarts, these things. Um, as they do those, they already have that set again on a per namespace basis. When you cross those, that's where it gets more interesting. They have other problems if it's crossing anyway, I would argue. So we do that in that context or in that uh, scope. I mean, you aren't talking a lot about the machine learning aspect of, I assume the observability is feeding back into the mechanism. Hmm. The, the, the training piece here, what, what are you initially training and how do you continually train those models? Are you using customer data to, to train those models? Are you somehow synthetically generating some means? No, the, so from a machine learning point of view, when I call out to the back end here, that's when machine learning um, is happening and what it's doing in a uh, given customer environment observability wise, there's tons of metrics. We focus on a very specific scope of that, which would be the CPU and memory requests and limits, replica counts, and then the HPA parameters. So again, number of replicas and target, uh, utilization. So we, we're taking such a small fraction of that. We take all of that, we send it back to the machine learning, and it's learning based on that specific environment. These are each in isolation at this time. We don't aggregate them and, and refine it any differently because our algorithm, frankly, is really good. I, everyone who does machine learning will say that, <laughs> but, uh, but we're really confident in it and how it performs such that we haven't had to do anything like that. I think there are, again, dreams and aspirations to start getting that way. Um, one of the things that's is, nice as, about this is these CPUs are change and things of that nature that these sorts of training metrics would have to change, right? Absolutely. And, and you've got different, you've got like AWS launch Graviton years ago, right? There's yeah, a lot yeah, more yeah. ARM proliferation. AMD's back out with some offerings now to make things interesting there too. Um, GPUs also, like we could go on a wild tangent with GPUs because some people care more about that and are using that. And Kubernetes, I don't think was, oh, I'm going to get in trouble in the community for this. I don't think they're ready for GPUs. Like GPUs were not part of the standard metric package, if you will. So people didn't think of them as something that would have a uh, utilization. They thought of them as just, oh, call it an accessory. It's like a storage device. Right? Right, you've added like, there's some extensions there that people are doing like Intel to yeah. give you access to GPUs and things. Yeah. The, the backend is getting trained. Are you, are you doing some kind of like reinforcement or reward based uh, model inference on the, on the front end then with the live? That's what's making the decisions. Can keep it, in the, keep it on, on the course. Basically, yes. I don't. Like, I don't want to get too into it, but okay. basically, yes. I mean, we're we're quite confident in what we've done. Over pull the out of you slowly. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, sneak something in my coffee. You might get better answers. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, since you did open up the, uh -oh, the can of box. GPU we worms, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but because we, we do now have the ability to you know present direct access to mm -hmm. uh, you know like direct access to NVMe, direct access to mm -hmm. GPU. There's going to be things that we can present right to the container. Yeah. Are Are you already preparing for that or or you know is that kind of a piece that you can add as part of the multivariant yeah you know i think um from an optimized pro perspective that is not the scope of this conversation but another product we offer optimized pro uh all of that is fair game because as long as we have access to the metrics of it and have some way of testing it no works optimized live gets a little more interesting why i say that is what is great about the observability platforms we integrate with is they have standard ways of representing it regardless of what you've done when there are not standards, and even call them de facto, like it doesn't have to be a strict Kubernetes standard. Uh, when there's not those, that makes it really tricky. So one thing, let me let me answer your question in a kind of funny way. 
one thing a lot of people have said is like, well, wait a minute, you've told me that with a Java-based app, it's gonna behave this way. Can't Optimize Live know that my app is Java? My answer is what metric do you express to do it? And they're like, oh, we use JVM exporter. And I'm like, okay, cool. This person uses Datadog's JVM exporter equivalent. This person uses, there's like 10 of them. How do we know? Should we prepare all 10? Like it's really tough as far as that goes. If there was one that was universal, it'd be a different story. I think we're going to solve that a different way in the future. Stay tuned. Maybe next cloud field day we'll talk about that. But I uh, overall, that's part of that challenge of optimized live considering things like GPUs. Uh, and forgive me, I'm woefully ignorant in that space. So I don't know that they don't all express it in a common way anyway. So maybe I'm speaking out of school here. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, there may be eventually some semantic representation in, in YAML because God loves YAML. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> But even, even doing, can you pull in labeling? as a way to influence outcomes in your engine, right? And, and yeah. maybe that. Your thoughts are in the same headspace are. Yeah. 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 Uh, final thing I'll show you before I, I, I go to the live demo, uh, assuming it's still running on my laptop at this point, is uh, this is what the interface looks like when you have a running application. So here we have Elasticsearch, excuse me, in its environment, it's got the monitoring namespace and it's got the auto scaler at the top showing the target. And, uh, I can't read it very well here. I think it says 85%. So that's saying, hey, the scale point should be 85% on that. And then specifically within there, we're seeing that the CPU recommendation is quite low, but the memory recommendation is quite high. So we're doing both dimensions of it. We're doing the horizontal element as well as the vertical scaling. So this way we're trying to get it right. And since these are both our <laughs> recommendations, they're working in concert. So before I was talking about how they fight, these are in unity. In this, this is a live demo environment. Uh, as you can see, so we're at the real time right here. Um, what in this a quick example so the last three hours what this has been set to is 500 now this is contrived okay i set explicitly this is the google microservices demo it's available in their github uh, i explicitly set this to 500 requests in other words i'm a developer who doesn't know yet i don't know what i need or don't need i set it to that and this has an element where all of the requests come in it's called the front end this one component is called the ad service there's 12 components in this in its entirety and what uh, Optimize Live is recommending is that we set it to 202. The actual usage over the last three hours, the highest it's been is 176. That seems quite reasonable to me. And then in addition to that, we say from an HPA point of view, and what we've done here is we've done the math to determine what we think the scale point should be for the HPA. In other words, since this has been, at least in the last three hours, between 156 and 176, we feel comfortable that at 200, you should kick a next replica out and be ready for the additional load. Overall, we've done the math on this as well to see what the savings is, because this is a frequently uh, asked question from customers. They want to know what they're saving or is this paying for itself, so to speak. But what I'll also tell you, and I don't know, again, the uh, fun of live demo, there are times where we recommend you need to increase. So what you set wasn't high enough. And so I'm hoping I'll, I'll be able to show you one of those here as well. Let's see. That one's a 31.8% savings. Oh, let me see if I can find, Redis tends to be a good one here. Okay, so Redis, uh, you all know, is an in-memory cache, right? Um, and this is a component of that. In this case, CPU-wise, we have some significant savings here. What I wanted to call out, though, at the same time, because there's another dimension here, which is memory. This was set to two gigs, and the usage is only seven megs. Now, that's based on my load, but here we're saying we could have saved you two gigs in the last hour, I used to jokingly say memory is gold, like it's the most expensive commodity on the planet when you need to add more memory. There's a significant potential here. Now I have this in manual mode right now because this is like, I'm thinking of this as a proof of concept for my customers where they wanna see it before they apply it. They don't want this in automatic mode. They trust but verify as we like to say, right? I wanna see that it's gonna do the right things. You also remember me speaking about the tolerance levels. Uh, what risk tolerance do you have? And we need to relabel that. I think it would be better said uh, CPU risk tolerance. But in this case, I have high. I typically would do memory low. Let me refresh it. It didn't change on that one. Let's see if that changes some of the other ones, though. But why I'm showing you this within a Grafana dashboard is, again, I want you to think of this at scale. This is but one application in one namespace. Uh, speaking to a customer a few weeks back, they have a, over 8,000 namespaces to consider. So the scale really becomes a challenge. So what I'm doing here is kind of going against the scale thing and zooming in and showing you a specific example, but think of this kind of in aggregate as a zoom out point to um, what the savings could be across the board that way. When you have applications, 
is there individual application awareness of like the profile of how an application behaves? So Redis, uh, RocksDB, uh, you know, Arango, they'll have different profiles on how they consume memory and especially at at traffic. It can be fundamentally different. Some are B tree, some are LSM, like sure. they, they will behave wildly differently. And so recommendations for memory allocation and actually even node presentation because of memory capabilities can be pretty important. So yeah. I'm just curious how much of the actual application awareness you pull into the algorithm itself. So the algorithm itself is woefully ignorant of the application. It does not know. What it does do though, you notice I was switch, talking between workloads. Um, I think most of these are Go apps except for the uh, Redis. Um, so as I toggle between those, each of these are assessed in isolation. So these metrics, I've only gone back the last three hours. I could go back further than that and see the patterns are being recognized across that time period. So if, if cart service acts a certain way, maybe because it's a Rust written app and it acts a certain way, the machine learning will notice that and watch that pattern. And it keeps it uh, separate from a recommendation perspective than perhaps the ad service, which runs a, a Golang app that runs this way. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have that knowledge though. It just, it doesn't know because the metrics it gets are different than, or uh, are common across all. So there's right. not a way to know that, oh, you know, shoot, that's this sort of app. You did mention though about heap awareness before, so that obviously, because you would never recommend, I presume oh, I'm gonna, <laughs> that you would never recommend to lower the memory allocation to a container lower than the, the heap, heap size that's set inside the application. Yeah. Yeah. Because then our, our IP your application won't boot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the heap awareness element is uh, what I call an aspirational goal based on the fact that there needs to be a commonality. So these metrics are all using common ones, again, CPU memory request limits and utilization as well as the HPA based ones. There's none, um, you may use your JVM in a certain way with JVM exporter, which expresses it as JVM underscore heap size. Somebody else uses a different one that calls it something different. Uh, and we don't, again, we don't need to split hairs on the, well, you could rename them. Of course you can rename them. I, I don't know how much I want to impose on a customer, how I want them to give me the metrics, especially because this is supposed to be kind of click, click easy approach. Again, at scale too, I don't want them, they could have one app team who chose to use JVM exporter. They have another app team who used a different Java metric exporter, right? Or that gets deeper in the interrogation. Yeah. So. Uh, but that's frankly the end of my demo. I mean, this sort of thing is, is kind of under the covers and behind the scenes in the sense that this is as exciting as it gets visually speaking. Because you're using Grafana, this is your, uh, this is, uh, is it a SaaS? Is it a local implementation? Uh, would it I deployed this into my cluster uh, to be able to interrogate the metrics that are there. Uh, I've got a Grafana enterprise license and I want to do reporting and, and like that. I can just plug it into my- Absolutely, yeah. And that's what we expect people to do. I, we don't want to dictate what people use as far as their observability platforms go. And can you actually then stream logs and, and decisions to maintain them over time if we were, you know, pack rats, we wanted to hang on to like all of this metric. Is there value in doing that? Uh, you know, is it a use case you've ever bumped into? So all of the recommendations are all plotted as metrics. So they can be pulled in anywhere. Logging wise, the only thing that we express as logs for us, um, we can go into like debug mode and a troubleshooting situation, but the only things we express as logs are um, more error states as a, or error conditions because everything else is a metric. And at scale, metrics are your answer as opposed to logs. Like logs are the exceptional approach. Like, oh shoot, we're seeing a pervasive issue. Time to fire up debug mode and see what's really going on here. Uh, so that's been our approach around that. At this point, are most of your customers, are all of your customers in public clouds or how does, how does that work? Do you have anyone using this on premises? And, and uh, yes, yeah. um, so uh, great question. Um, our customers, I would say all of them, I'm gonna say dabble in public cloud. I'm not dodging your question, but more to say, that they are kind of on a journey and the journey is taking a heck of a lot longer than they ever expected. And so where this gets interesting is, I talked earlier about the sandbox environments. They have their colos or their own data centers and they've run out of space. With supply chain issues, they can't get more equipment in as fast as they expect or we're used to. And so they've been using us to squeeze more into that so that they can do it. So we do, honestly, I feel like at the moment it's more of their own, I'll call it self-managed environments than a cloud provider environment. So your machine learning, is that in a public cloud or is that in a colo? Yeah, we're running up in a public cloud. Yeah. Okay. You, know, just have, you presume you have an exporter that sends a, a certain amount of metric data across and it's you know, safely uh, anonymized, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, the biggest challenge we have there is um, every customer has a different level of sensitivity as far as what data gets sent. I always make the argument, I'm like, it's metrics data. If I told you my CPU is using 44%, how did I compromise anything? And 
what they'll say is, well, you know what, we use our customer names as our namespace names. And I was like, okay, that's fair. So we kind of, uh, we walk this line at the moment where most folks are extremely comfortable with it. Um, I think we're gonna have some other solutions coming soon that will address those sensitivities as well. So the machine learning is effectively learning across all your instances, every solution that you're running in any place is providing information to the machine learning algorithm. Training wise. In, in, in general, yes. In general, yes. Sorry to be so big. So I apologize if you hit this and I missed it, but how is this being deployed into our clusters? It deploys into its own namespace. We call it Stormforge system. You can specify which one. And what it'll do at that point is it will follow the activity feed of the Kube API to see what's going on and see that deployments have rolled out, not rolled out these things. Also applies the role-based access control permissions required to do those activities and ties into the observability platform that you use so that we can pull the data to make those informed decisions. So all those parts that you just that you just brought up, I could, I'm assuming there's like a Helm chart or something yep, like this that we can- exactly right, Helm chart. Yay. Okay, and then this, it deploys, pull all of that information and then uploads it into where it needs to go for the, that panel. Yeah, the only, the only parts that do any like uploading or call home to Stormforge for a machine learning element are the metric elements. We don't, frankly, we don't care about like your deployment having these dependencies or these pods. It doesn't matter to us. What matters are the metrics. Again, to see what they asked for versus what they're actually using to make the uh, informed decision about what to do. And I see the try it for free up there. How long is, is that available? Um, I think definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I got a Raspberry Pi cluster. I want to try it on. APS <laughs> for the win, baby. <laughs> what what CPU is that again? Arm V7, 8 or something? VR. I got to see the way it was. Let's not get into the minutiae. We oh. call them T Rex <laughs> arms. <laughs> What's its, uh, how, how you price product? Uh, cores, based on the cores of the systems that are being. The bought. cluster is a thing looked yep. at. Yep. How high touch is the install? I mean, it sounds like. There's a Helm chart, but at the same time, you've got to hook into the observability platform. And if I assume you don't support every observability platform under the sun, if so I have one, maybe it's not just in your wheelhouse. Do you then do a custom implementation or integration there? No, not at this time. Um, as far as the, to your question about the install process, yeah. uh, these are basically just parameters you pass to the Helm chart with the values, or you can do it in the Helm command line. So dash dash metric URL equals, and you can specify Datadog, or you can specify okay. Prometheus and do it that way. Um, so it's pretty hands-off once it's installed. I think really the challenge that I keep seeing is we've been iterating quickly on this and it's how do we handle upgrades? Uh, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't do the upgrades automatically or anything like that because our customers haven't been comfortable with that. They don't want their cluster changing uh, because we changed something, they want to actually take the action. So that's probably the biggest um, hands-on element I've seen so far. And couldn't the upgrade process really be rolling out the fr fresh, like in a, into a staging environment or a UAT environment and then that just you just roll through fresh and kind of it absolutely could be it's more about uh notifications i don't know how people today are using helm chart changes and tracking them upstream to then roll them into their own environment you don't assume everyone's just doing GitOps out of the box <laughs> i don't assume that because i don't see that i, I wish i saw it more 